I visit lots of churches in the course of my work, both to encourage churches to support missionaries around Europe, but also because I want those churches themselves to be involved in evangelism. And I see the same thing over and over again. Uh, pastors, churches who say, we want to grow, we want to uh, reach folk uh, with the gospel, see people converted to Jesus. And then when I begin to say, okay, how is that going to look like in practice? Suddenly that initial enthusiasm dries up. And I think it's because we like the idea of growth and conversion and revival and everything else taking place. When it comes to the bit, we're not sure we actually want the cost. And I suspect that in history, it's often been like that. If you look back at the history of revivals, uh, one uh, evidence that there has been historically with lots of revivals in the past is that you've suddenly had this influx of immorality uh, into the church. Uh, the reason being uh, the Holy Spirit suddenly begins to work with huge power and people's lives are changed. They begin to meet with the church and they come into the church with their lives all messed up and the confusion and all their baggage with them. And the church suddenly thinks, oh, we, we didn't sign up for this. And uh, they end up squeezing those people back, back out again. So we need to really think about, uh, do we actually want to grow? Because if we do want to grow, then there's a, a price tag that's necessarily going to be attached to it. Um, and one of the best ways in which I think we can illustrate this is to uh, look at the issue of parenting. Now, I, I won't be able to see on the screen uh, how many of you uh, people are, are parents. Uh, but when I first became a parent, my first child was a daughter. It was really no problem. She was a, a golden child. And, and we as parents uh, um, quite naively thought we must be great parents. And then child number two came along and it was the opposite. Uh, life was just hard uh, from then onwards. And uh, three was, was worse again. But by that stage, it's too late to turn back. Uh, but, but having a baby can have all kinds of consequences. First of all, at cost, not just in finance, although finance is huge. I mean, if you've seen the, the, the cost of disposable nappies uh, and how much food kids can pack away, uh, but the time that you take, life is essentially over once you begin to have kids. Uh, it just grinds to a, a, a halt because your, your time is absorbed with kids. Uh, and then it's messy. Um, and I used to think, well, the mess will only be for about the first you know, 10 to 15 years of their lives. I now have a 25-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 16-year-old, and the mess is still there. If anything, it's got worse. So uh, uh, mess never really uh, goes away. Uh, sleepless nights. I, I, I look back to my 40s. Well, my 30s and 40s, that's when my parenting began. And I define my 30s and 40s as um, just being tired and jaded all the time. And, and family was a lot to do with that. Uh, and then when, when you have kids, there's that vulnerability and the need to protect, and that need is, is, is a really challenging one for you as a, a parent. And then try to teach the basics to kids. It just takes so long and they never seem to grasp it. I still can't teach my 20 year old uh, how to tidy her room. And I've been rabbiting on at her for, uh, for the last two decades. It's, it seems to have made no difference. It's, it's just taking uh, endless amounts of time. Uh, so when you, when you think about the issue of parenting, it's patience, 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 and that will just continue ad infinitum. Now, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that the Bible uses that very analogy of spiritual babies when it talks about the whole conversion process and, and growth. And unless we get that mindset into, my, into, into our heads, I think the issue of growth will, will simply elude us because we will have that experience of churches that we say, we want folk to trust in Jesus. And then if we are intentional about doing that and we see the price tag, uh, we then begin to have real doubts. Now, I, I think that there are lots of um, uh, ways in which we can identify uh, how churches don't really want to go down that uh, track. And, and here's a few uh, clues as to, to why churches uh, don't become, if you like, user-friendly or convert-friendly. One, uh, being stuck in a groove. Now, uh, how, how many of you, by the way, are actual church leaders at the moment? Hands up, those of you who are actual church leaders. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll mention one word to you, and right away you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's the word momentum. Trying to maintain momentum in church life is agonizing. And as soon as you stop, uh, 
one thing inevitably happens, and that is that the car begins to slow down. It doesn't matter if you're doing at 20 kilometers an hour or 140 kilometers an hour. As soon as you take your foot off the accelerator, the whole thing will finally grind to a stop. And churches can get so caught up with that um, maintenance mode that they cease to think about growth itself. The two things are different. Maintenance, keeping the thing going, is really about the Christians you already have in the church. But uh, what we're talking about here is actual growing, bringing new people on board. And that takes much more than just, uh, I drive an automatic car. Uh, it's much more than just putting the, the car into, um, into cruise control and hoping you just keep going along. That will never get you anywhere. All that will do is keep maintenance mode going. To get growth, the foot needs to be pressed down on the accelerator and you come across those bends and those twists in the road. You can't let your foot off the accelerator and driving like that is truly, truly frightening, but that's what's required. Uh, then of course, um, you have the, 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 the situation where once you uh, get into that maintenance mode as, as, as church, and you have those Christians that you already have, and they're growing in Christ, and they're maturing. They, of course, are in their lives that they're in a kind of a bubble. And their bubble is moving inexorably away from the bubble of either very young Christians or even folk who aren't Christians at all. And so a really frightening experience is this. Uh, when you have a church that's going through that group for two or three years with no converts helping whatsoever, and then you bring an unchurched friend of yours along, that unchurched friend will walk in and think, have I landed on Mars here? Because the bubble that those existing Christians are, are, are living in is continuing to move away from the real world as it is, unless they're in constant contact with new Christians or in constant contact with non-Christians. And the gap becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And it becomes ever more difficult to get back to a, a serious growth mode. And then uh, because you become comfortable in your cruise control, uh, no particular big problems in church, a few issues, but nothing particularly earth shattering. Uh, you get comfortable with that. And then the thought of trying to adapt the whole thing to accommodate new Christians or trying to deal with non-Christians becomes inherently unsettling. And, and, and there's a few, I, I guess, uh, smaller telltale signs of this. Here, here's a few that I've come across, and I actually continue to come across. Number one, uh, teaching becomes theoretical. Now, I am not against uh, expository teaching or, or, or uh, truly deep, profound teaching for Christians. I, I do that myself. I'm by disposition and academic, um, I, and I love hearing great expository teaching. And of course, every church has its own menu of teaching, but lots of churches here in the UK, their, their main body of teaching comes from a Sunday sermon. If that is too theoretical, it will not help with growth mode because you're having folk who will come into your church because they're either new Christians or they're not Christians at all, and they listen to that wonderful expository preaching and it just goes over their head. I just finished reviewing a book for one of my publishers. I, I, I've, they've asked me to do a book review. And it's of one of the best expositors uh, that I know uh, in the Western world. Wonderful uh, exposition of John's gospel. And I, I loved it immensely doing the review because it, it, it fed my soul. It was a model exposition. If I gave that to one of my friends who plays football with me, who's not a Christian, their eyes would glaze over. They have no idea what this is about. Now, uh, if, 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 if teaching becomes too theoretical, if it's too much a menu for mature Christians, you're not ready for growth because you'll do nothing for new Christians. Um, then there's all the, the little kingdoms that take place in church. Now, I, I don't know what the little kingdoms in your church are. I know what the little kingdoms are in, in, in my church. That's all those um, power structures that, that exist uh, beneath the surface uh, and people who 
press you as, as leadership, as, as pastors to, to move in one direction or another. I'll give you a very quick example. A, a while ago, I was visiting a church that I've, I, I've preached at a lot. And I took an unchurched friend of mine along because I wanted him to, to hear the gospel. We came just on time for the church service. We went and sat down at a seat. And just before the pastor got up to, to lead the service, a couple came in fairly late and they walked up to where we were uh, sitting. They eyeballed the two of us and said, that's my seat, you need to move. And I felt profoundly embarrassed and I'm an experienced Christian, let alone my unchurched friend who's never been to church. He's already nervous being there and now being told in, all, in front of all these people, you've got to move. Uh, well, that couple represented one of the powerful families in that church who, who frankly bankrolled the thing. So there's no way you're going to say no when you've taken their seat and they say you move. That church is already preparing itself for death. And then all the in-house rules. If it's going to take you more than five minutes to explain to an, un an unchurched friend of yours how your service runs or what's going to happen, you're not ready for growth. Uh, we have taken Christianity, which is basically about fellowship and prayer and learning to be like Jesus and um, growing together. And we've institutionalized it and thrown in a thousand and one rules, which unchurched folk find profoundly confusing and disorientating. So too many in-house rules, but that can be a, a, a real problem. Uh, then there's, as I've already uh, mentioned, the, the maintenance mindset, which also includes pastoral pandering. Now, what do I mean by pastoral pandering? Sometimes folk come to me in my church and they share with me a pastoral problem. And I say, well, I, I need to visit you. We need to spend time together over coffee. We need to pray. Other times they come to me and they explain to me a pastoral problem. And I'm saying, you need to get life. I mean, I don't know why that's a problem to you. Just grow up. Here's the issue. Churches and maintenance mindset, because they're not dealing with the real world and real issues and real problems, tiny things become huge and they want pastoral care for the most ridiculous of issues. And I'm going to say, well, why don't you come with me to a friend just down the road? She's a single mom with three kids. And her oldest child has developed a drug problem. And her husband or, or her previous husband, who still comes to visit, sometimes still beats her. That's a pastoral problem. So don't give me any of your nonsense. Now, I, I, I wouldn't be quite as curt or rude as that. But seriously, some of the pastoral issues, some of the things that folk uh, want me to come and visit them because of, I, I think, catch a grip. Are you living in the real world? Pastoral pand pand pandering takes over. And you're dealing with the in-house problems of the comfortable generation, the comfortable Christians, uh, rather than real issues of, of, of everyday spiritual warfare. And in the loss of focus, what is church actually for? Church does not exist for the church program. Church exists to empower Christians to reach the lost. The program is merely the method by which you do that. So let's not lose our focus. Our, our focus is, is to reach the lost. So, so, so how do we get back to, if we've, if we've fallen into that kind of maintenance mode, how do we get back to um, really becoming a church that's ready for growth? Well, it, it really does come back to basics, and it's, it's simple, simple stuff. This is not rocket science. Number one, in your church, you've got to develop a passion for reaching the lost. Now, some of you will say, well, surely all Christians have a passion for reaching the lost. No. In my experience in the UK, about 10% of Christians have a passion for reaching the lost. The rest don't really care that much. Now, why do I say that? Well, uh, let me give you an example. Um, over the last uh, 12 months, we've had lots of lockdown in the UK and churches have been online for about a year now. And so my preaching itinerary has been all by doing, you know, Facebook Live and Zoom and all that kind of stuff with churches that I normally go to preach at. And as the lockdown has, has extended after many, many uh, weeks, 
I've begun to ask questions that I've been preaching. I've said to folk on screen, um, how many of you during this last week have spoken to uh, one of your neighbors or an unchurched person that you know about Jesus? Put your hand up. And it has genuinely frightened me as to how few hands have gone up. And just in case somebody puts their hand up um, uh, without really meaning it, just to, just to show off, I'll, I'll say, okay, those of you who got your hands up, tell me the story of who you've spoken to about Jesus. What I think has happened is this. For many, many Christians, um, they have expected their church pastor or their church leaders to organize the evangelism, whether it's a, an alpha course of Christianity Explored or the Youth Club or, or um, the small group outreach or, or whatever. And they just fit into the church program. During lockdown, all that stuff has stopped. So it's up to the individual to go out and share Jesus. Now, I think it's a good thing, actually. It's one of the best things that's happened to church over the last year. It's exposed our lack of personal evangelism, but it's also highlighted for us the challenge of personal evangelism. What happens if persecution begins to strike, as it did when I grew up in Ethiopia? I come from Ethiopia. And in 1978, all the churches were shut, all of them. And so the only evangelism you can do in the entire country is personal evangelism, because there are no churches left, no church buildings. They're all confiscated. Now, we've had that kind of a thing, uh, persecution light during this lockdown, and it's up to the individual. Christians are not witnessing. They don't have a passion for the lost because if they did have a passion. They'd have gone round to their street during lockdown and found a way of sharing the gospel. They'd have found a way. People with passion find a way. So that's, that's how it begins. Develop a passion for the lost amongst your congregation. And it might come down to being as blunt as this. Speak to every member of your church and ask them that question that I ask. Maybe elongate it, not just a week. Give them a month for the sake of, of Christian grace. In the last month, who have you spoken to about Jesus? That's a really challenging question, but that's how we start. Uh, develop a passion for the lost. And what Rico said earlier on, I 100% endorse. If they're not talking to people, ask them then, uh, who are you praying for? What non-Christians that you know about are you praying for every day about their spiritual need? Because when people pray, they'll begin to witness. That happens. So uh, develop that passion for the lost and confront folk about, about the lack of passion for the lost. Uh, number two, uh, we need to understand the world of the unchurched because churches do get into this bubble. Um, your Sunday, it's, you know, you wake up, you get the kids ready, uh, you go to church. I don't know how many services your church would normally run this Sunday. And then very often the rest of your Sunday is visits or, or, or social life that sits off the back of your Sunday service as Christians spend time together or go for a walk in the park and, or, or all the rest of it. Where I live, the average guy of my age, uh, he spends most of Sunday morning in his pajamas because Friday and Saturday night are drinking nights. So Sunday is recovery day. So Sunday morning is pajamas. You might get something to eat by midday or one o'clock in the afternoon. And then you think, well, what football is in the television? And that's, that's how you live your life. It's a, it's a different world. And most Christians, the longer they exist in the church bubble, the, longer, the, the more detached they become from the world of genuine, everyday, unchurched people. Now, I, I work and live in a particularly um, working class, socially deprived area. Other folk live in very different types of areas. I, I, I know that. Uh, they live amongst the, the glitterati or the jet set or, or, or the uh, upperly mobile um, young professionals. But the principle is still the same. We don't understand the lifestyle or the, the worldview, uh, the, the, the sits and leaven of, of everyday normal people. We need to understand how unchurched people, non-Christians live. Uh, one thing I did with my church years ago, I, I said to folk, um, I, I'm going to shorten our service 
I deliberately cut the length of my uh, preaching in half and we um, shrunk our worship time in half as well. And I said to folks, the reason why I'm giving you much less time in the church services, I want you to leave this building and just go for a walk. Just go out for a walk. Down the street, town center, down to a park, just start to mingle with people and make a friend. And start asking questions about their life and learn what their experience is like day by day and get out of the bubble. I think not being at church physically for the last few months has done lots of Christians good because they've had to experience real life outside. So, so learn how unchurched folk live and then uh, maybe develop um, the right shape for growth. Because right now, maybe the shape, the structure you have on your typical Sunday might not be appropriate to the lifestyle, the circumstance of people where you live, where your church is. Uh, that might mean changing stuff, which, of course, puts the fear of God and in, in, in folk in your congregation, because people in congregations, they don't like change. Well, if you don't like change, then maybe you shouldn't think of a growth. Because growth might necessitate change. Now, change doesn't just mean um, developing new stuff. It might also mean dropping stuff that doesn't work or that doesn't have a purpose. Church people, of course, are going to be very busy. Unless some event or program item you have in your church program, unless it has a genuine purpose to it, a real important purpose, a real rationale, don't do it. Scrap it. Because life is too busy to have items in your church program that are uh, not particularly uh, useful. Drop them. Life is too busy for that. And maybe think about new things, including new times. One of the guys that I've got to know recently is a guy who's a night shift worker. So any time between uh, let's say nine o'clock in the morning when he gets home after his night shift to roughly five o'clock in the afternoon. That's out for him. That's his only time to sleep or to be with his children. Any activity that's useless. But if you think of other times, uh, one of his best times, because um, uh, Saturday is his, 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 his um, or sorry, Friday is his day off. Uh, and, and the time he spends time with his family, has a bit of time with his friends, any time after 10 o'clock at night on a Friday, that's great for him. Why not do that? It, it might mean thinking through all kinds of new times and having different groups that you're trying to reach, depending on, this, on, on the, the area where your church is based. And then think of your parenting skills. Unless we know what parenting is all about and we understand good parenting, we won't really know how to deal with um, new Christians, which means we won't really know how to deal with, with, with growth. We might have become so secure in that bubble that is church, dealing with adults, spiritually speaking, that dealing with babies all over again is, is a frightening prospect. Well, let's learn what parenting means again because that's going to be part of what we need to prepare for growth. And that will mean confronting realities. Number one, emotional challenges. I, I was saying to some guys last night that uh, I'm doing a visit this week of a lovely Christian guy, a really lovely Christian guy who's growing in his faith and he's developing. He's desperate to serve God. Uh, he, he got saved and uh, I, I've been involved in his discipleship. He has profound mental health issues. And I mean, really profound mental health issues to the point where one day he phoned me uh, from his workplace. He had a bit of a meltdown. And I said, where are you? He said, I'm at work. And I said, well, there seems to be a bit of an echo on your phone. He said, uh, I'm in a cupboard. He was so traumatized by an experience at work, given his already difficult mental health issues. He went into a stationary cupboard and hid there and phoned me. Now, that's a guy who loves Jesus and is desperate to serve and wants to make something of his Christian life. But he's drug maintained with serious mental health issues. 
that's a big issue. As a parent, you can't walk away. How are you going to cope with that? Or think of some of the moral challenges. Um, I had a series of a group of pastors I was dealing with recently on a on a kind of um, a seminar with pastors, and I was talking about the issue of pastoral care uh, in the context of our our current generation. And one of these pastors asked me a serious question, which I've I've often thought about but but tried to avoid, and it's the question: What would your worst pastoral nightmare be? And I gave him a straight answer. Here's my worst pastoral nightmare. Um, you get in touch with a gay couple. This, by the way, for me, isn't academic because I am dealing with more than one gay couple who are married. And I mean legally married. So by the constitution of the UK, they're legally married. Okay. A gay couple, legally married. They have young kids who belong to that marriage, and then one becomes a Christian. What do you do? Now, I'm not even going to explore the issues that suddenly arise, but you don't have to take long to, to think about what those issues might be. How will you handle that as a church without blowing your church apart? Now, I think I know what I would do, but I'll not say any more because it fills me with trepidation, but that might happen in my situation. And by the way, if you're serious about evangelism, it might happen in your situation too. What will you do and how will your church cope with that? Real issues. And then the art of discipleship. The older I've become as an evangelist, as a pastoral carer, the more I've discovered how how complex life is, how broken people are, and how much we need to get back to just basic discipleship. I, I, I don't know any other answer, any other answer, apart from basic discipleship, helping people to follow in Jesus' footsteps. They will stumble, they will fall, they will, they will falter. We will often be so far behind Jesus as he walks before us and we try to follow him but just following his footsteps, getting back to basic discipleship. And unless our churches completely absorb and swallow that need just to, to take discipleship seriously and to live in it and to commit to it, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. The regular Sunday program with Midweek House Group isn't going to do it.